night, I went to the Rise for Refugees gathering that was happening at the, uh, at the Ridgely Christian Church. Uh, and it was the local city and, and area Rise for Refugees organization that uh, had, got, had gathered people both to look at uh, where we are, not just because of the, the, the intensity and the, that's, that's going on right now, the kinds of actions that have happened over the last few weeks, but also politically and, and just this, what's the state for refugees and for asylees or asylum seekers in our country and listening to their stories. And I think as, as we have privileges for traveling around the world and such and others are trying to get here from around the world because of various persecution or various oppressiveness or various fear for their very lives, and several of these folks had shared their stories from Zimbabwe, from, from Afghanistan and Iraq and, and, um, and elsewhere. And it was just profound to hear these stories. One of the most interesting things that really caught me and surprised me, because I, I knew these stories, right? And we read about these stories, and I'm sensitive to these realities. It, there, I was, first of all, surprised and inspired by the fact that there were 100 people gathered on a Saturday night. You know, they'd given up their Saturday night to come and hear these stories. I was also surprised because I know we have anxieties about gathering right now in public around these issues. We're just kind of afraid. We have this culture of fear right now. And, but what really surprised me and got me rethinking everything was how they spoke about being in, in the U.S., some it took years to get here through a process of applying for just in their embassies locally, applying for refugee status, and then applying for asylum once they got refugee status, and then applying for citizenship once they got that, and they couldn't even apply for work visas until some of those things were in process. But here they are, refugees, but no work, so how are they going to support family? It's just a nightmare of complications. And some of them took five to six, seven years, and they'd still be in their country and then some were waiting here for three or four or five years for the next step. Just a very challenging reality. But what they said to a person was how much they loved being in the United States because it was a place, in spite of the, the hatred, and they know hatred. They, that's why they want to be here. They know violence. They know fear. But they also discovered this connectiveness of people who are compassionate by nature, who are compassionate by the very nature of their country. Such a strange thing to hear that being said, that they experience this place as a place of possibilities, even when the odds are against them. They know this is a place of possibilities, and they don't feel alone. That's such a strange thing for me to hear from a position of knowing I have so many options not even to have to think about it. So we've been thinking about what makes a place sacred, of what makes space sacred as we travel, and we're visitors and guests places, and as, we hear, as we're here and we move from place to place, day to day, moment to moment, what makes a place sacred? And so we've been following this, um, this, this sort of this model by uh, 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 Mary Oliver, this little poem, Instructions for Living. It's quoted here in your bulletin too. But Instructions for Living... Um, uh, pay attention, be amazed, and tell about it. Sort of three little simple things. Pay attention, be amazed, and tell about it. But there's a lot there to think about, I think. So last week we talked about paying attention, and we talked about the profound possibilities that happen when we notice things, when we actively notice things. We literally physiologically change not only our bodies and our brains when we actively take notice of things, we change the very dynamic of the relationship when we begin to take notice of things. And it's a practice, as we talked about mindfulness, something that, that, uh, that Daryl is very involved with and, and, um, and others within our room here are very involved with, with mindfulness. Joseph is in... Where's Joseph? Joseph? Where are you, Joseph? Joseph, I know you're in here. Okay, maybe Joseph is not in here for the moment. But Joseph, Joseph uh, is, is also very involved in, in mindfulness with the legal, legal profession. So we have this reality that we're very aware of mindfulness, and yet all of those practices, Joseph's in the back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, I'm sorry, you didn't want me to point at, point at you. Joyce, talk to Joseph about, about um, mindfulness because it's a practice that is now taking place in all, of our, in all of our cultures, in all of our cultures, our work culture, as well as our church culture, as, as well as our educational culture. But here's the thing, simply taking notice is like a jump start to changing 
the physiology of your body, the physiology of your brain, and the, and the dynamic of the relationship. Now, that's important because in a minute, I want to talk to you about something else, about the dynamic of relationship. So today, we're talking about what it means to be amazed. And we kind of play around with this idea of amazing. Now, the word that was used here was uh, they were beside themselves. I'm going to jump ahead here and talk about amazement first because that's typically what's in all of the other uh, uh, um, Bible uh, versions. And, and so, uh, Philip, could you pl put up the slide that shows the, the various... Oh, no. Um, can you go... Oh, you know what? You may not have gotten the other one. Uh, you probably didn't get the other one then that I sent that had the different Bible versions with the different words they used. Okay, that didn't get to you. That's all right. So I'll talk about them. So first, the modern English version says they were amazed. Verse 26. The Living Bible says they were gripped with awe and fear. The New Revised Version says they were, uh, they were seized by amazement, which I like. I like the fact that they were sort of seized. Um, the voice, everyone was stunned. Young's little tr literal translation, which supposedly looks at the Greek and makes a little translation, says, astonishment took hold of them all. My favorite is the message. It says the people rub their eyes. <laughs> you know, I just I love that. They rub their eyes. Huh? And then, but, my, but, but the one I wanted to use was this one from the common, common English, because what it says was, they were all beside themselves. Because if you look up the Greek word, which is ecstasis, that's the word, or ecstasis, that's the word that's used here. When Jesus does this thing, and pronounces this man forgiven, and the Pharisees are all upset, suddenly everybody else in the room is amazed. But what, they're really, what it really says is, they are beside themselves. Literally, they are taken out of their bodies, so to speak. Their whole reality has been turned upside down. Something about what they thought they saw has suddenly changed. Nothing's the same. I like to think about this idea of amazement because we, so, we sometimes take it for granted as being something that's just kind of fun, kind of good, kind of exciting. We say, well, that performance was amazing. Or they say that that, uh, that that beautiful piece of art is amazing. But amazement means something else. Think about a time when you literally found yourself seeing something completely new for the first time because what you had thought you'd always understood, suddenly it's all changed. And it's changed how you now relate to one another or how you now think about yourself. Sometimes that can happen very quickly. Sometimes it usually takes a period of time. It may happen over a our lifetime as we begin to gain more and more insight we start to see more and more about what we thought we knew even now I'm I'm what 30 years 25 years away from my seminary training and I want to talk to you about a guy named Lou Adams Lou Adams was a professor at per at uh, Bright Divinity School but he was the director of the pastoral care center at Bright Lou Adams was an interesting kind of guy. He never missed with words. And so Linda and I, who did an internship there for about a year and a half as counselors, when he would do supervision with all the counselors afterwards, he never missed words. He would just look at one or two of us, and then he would kind of go, hmm, 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 hmm. <laughs> and then he would look at you and say, so, which one was having the crisis, the client or you? And we'd have to sit there and sort of take a look at where it was that we were really sort of not trans... We, were, we weren't experiencing transference. We were transferring onto the client, right? But he also said something that I used to just kind of laugh at. And I said, come on, that's not true. He would say to us, remember, everything is about power. Every relationship is about power. He said, For work, family, church, sidewalk, on the road, in counseling, all relationships are about power in one form or another. Who has it, who doesn't, who wants more of it. Even our relationship with life itself is about how we see ourselves in relation to where we are. It's about power and the power differential. But we're hardly ever aware of it. But it's how we end up living our lives out. And it's also how we also end up getting in a lot of conflicts with one another or with life itself because we're not really present to the power dynamic that's going on. And so when I started thinking about this story, I started thinking about it differently because I used to think about this story as just one more miracle story where somebody gets healed 
and we have this sort of Benny Hinn television moment where the guy jumps up and he runs off and everybody's like, yay, that was amazing. And I thought, okay, now wait a minute, that's just not where I am with what scripture is and how it works. And if you set aside the miracle, then what's left with this story? What's the story about if it's not about the miracle? And I remember what Lou Adams said, and it, and it got me thinking about who's in the room, in the scene. As Lou Adams went ask, he might ask, what's the relationship of power in this room? Rooms are always about spaces where some element or relationship of power is present. So we have Jesus teaching in somebody's room. You have disciples who are the followers. Disciple literally means students. So you have learners that are in the room, anxious to find out the next thing. And then you have a, probably a number of social outcasts that shouldn't be there. The unclean, the unwelcome in the temple. Uh, perhaps even, perhaps as, as many people as, as Jesus had encountered that were Samaritans, there might even be a random Samaritan in there. You might even have a Roman or a Gentile in there. But you'd have all of these different people in there, and certainly not people who would typically be in the temple listening to this rabbi in this room, and then a handful of defiant Pharisaic legalists and critics who are surveying this inappropriate crowd, and they're waiting for a chance to pounce on Jesus when he crosses the line. And then there's probably a crowd pressing at the door, as it says, because these fellows picked up their friend, wanted to get him inside, couldn't get through the door, so they ended up doing something else. So you have all of these people that probably are pressing in, trying to get in, the unclean, the unaccepted, the outcasts, the out, the out, the, on the fringe, they're all in there, as well as the legalists and the Pharisees. And it's really an uncomfortable scene. You've got to imagine just how uncomfortable this setting is. In here, we're largely pretty much in agreement or at least we're comfortable with not being in, in exact agreement on all things. Imagine if we were in a room where we knew there were at least half the people that disagreed with us, or half the people that were angry with us, or half the people that would look at us and say, you don't really belong here. Imagine if we were in a space like that. That's who's in that room, and that's where Jesus is. And the whole scene is wrong because none of these people should be together in a room. Do you get that? The whole scene is wrong. None of these people, everywhere Jesus finds himself, everywhere we find Jesus, it's wrong. None of these people should be together, which should tell us something. So here's this moment of tension, and what happens? The ceiling breaks open, and these guys are lean, they're, they're lowering their friend in through the ceiling. Literally, something breaks into this moment and it changes the whole dynamic. Now that's important. I want you to, to think about that. It even surprises Jesus. Even Jesus is surprised by this. And when the guy gets lowered down, the first thing he says is your sins are forgiven. Now think about sins. This is a, this is a guy who's, who's handicapped, he's paralyzed. I mean, what kind of sins did he actually perform, engage in? We have tax collectors, we have, we have Samaritan, we have all sorts of other people that we can point at for sins, but he looks at this guy and says, your sins are forgiven. Because he's not talking about actions. He's talking about narrative. He's talking about who you are in relation to the world. You are loved. You are a part of the very ground of being. You don't have to worry about anything. You belong here. Now, he could have said which he did say, you, you know, you're healed. And, and, and as the Pharisees, of course, look at him and they say, you can't do that. That's where you cross the line. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, well, I'm the human one. And this is to show you the human one can, can do this. But if you need proof, okay, get up and walk. And so the guy has a Benny Hinn moment and he gets up and he runs out the door. Now, I say this tongue in cheek because I want you to realize if you're thinking the most important thing about this story is a miracle, then of course you miss the point. Because you really need to be in that room and realize just how wrong this is. You really need to be at, if you're a Democrat, you really need to be sitting in the midst of a Republican convention. If you're a Republican, you really need to be sitting in the presence of a Democratic convention. If you're a fundamentalist, you really need to be at a Unitarian church. This is wrong, people. And Jesus looks out and says, your sins are forgiven. Well, of course the Pharisees are upset because Jesus is turning up the whole system of reality. 
He's completely equalizing power. He's completely taking away the power differential and saying, you all belong. And it's messing with them. They don't know what to do. So I love this story because it's not, just about, it's not about the, that miracle. It's about two things that happen simultaneously that I think we sometimes need to be aware of when we're looking towards that experience of being amazed. And the first one is this, that some kind of mischievousness is used in order to get to that place of healing and wholeness and deep connection to life. And at the same time, there's this sudden upending of how we understand this happens. In terms of how wholeness happens, we're completely confused. We're com it completely upends what we think is normative for this. Both of these things are happening at the same time. As if to say that there's something about finding holiness and, and wholeness in God that, that involves first being seized by amazement, being thrown outside yourself, literally being beside yourself with unfamiliarity, right? We don't get there very easily. Some of us get there from unfortunate circumstances, and we've got to figure out how to put life back together, and then suddenly, slowly, a little bit at a time, we begin to realize, oh, this new path is something completely different. And I feel whole in the midst of my supposed unwholeness or my brokenness. I'm suddenly finding meaning and depth. Some of us don't get there because we just try to stay comfortable and we'll try to do whatever we can to find a place of comfort. But what Jesus is doing in these scenes like this one, these scenes remind us that the one place where amazement can happen is the place where it's all wrong. In fact, that may be the only place that amazement can really happen, is that place where things are all wrong. The challenge for us is to realize that the redemption is just waiting, right? I came up with this phrase last week as I was thinking about noticing things, that the way to get towards that redemptive moment is to begin to notice what's there. Because what Jesus is essentially telling the people around him is he's saying the human one, and we're going to talk about this in a new series called What It Means to Be Human or How to Be Human, but Jesus is saying the human one, which is a way of saying, now, now Augustine and others since the 3rd century, 4th century started making this something very magical and supernatural and very dual, dualistic, very separate. But initially what this simply meant was the incarnate one. The one who represents God in the midst of our reality. As if to say, the very ground of our being, whatever that is and however that is, the very possibility and potentiality ground of our being is who we all are. You just haven't seen it yet. You need to be amazed. And so Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. The, the human one, like you, I'm showing you that. Every single moment becomes noticeably redemptive. All of our moments, but particularly those moments that beg for amazement. So, Philip, if you'll put this up here. So, a couple of things very quickly as, we, as I wrap this one up. First, how do we experience this sense of amazement? Well, we take two steps forward. But, of course, to take two steps forward, you almost always have to have one step back. And the reality is, is even as my wife and I were waking up this morning, and, and she was getting ready to go off to Michigan, and I was going to be a week or so without her, and she's saying, um, and, and I'm, having, I'm just waking up, and she starts to open up the curtains so we can look out on the trees, and she smiles, and she's about to sing her James Taylor song that, you know, I sing in here, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning, and she's about to do that, and I'm mad. Because I'm not happy. My reality is being challenged. And she smiles at me and she says, now think about what you're doing. Take a moment to think about this and notice. And think about a couple of things that are, that are good, that are positive, that are possibilities. We always find ourselves in those situations where we've taken one step back. We think we've made some progress, and sure enough, we're in the same habitual pattern because that's our biology. We operate out of reptilian brains. We look for safety, flight or fight. 
It's hard to take a step back. I was at a taco stand the other day. I went to the refugee group last night, and I thought, how, how opposite. And I was at a taco stand the other day, and a delivery guy comes in, and he's going to deliver tacos to someone. He's about 6'4", looks like he weighs about 300 pounds, has a long ponytail behind him, tattoos on his body, long beard, and he looks at me, and he says, hey. And I'm waiting for my taco, and he puts his bag down there, and I said, hey. And I hear some noise, and it's, this is busy, it's a busy place, but I hear some noise like there's somebody talking, and then he pulls out this large speaker that he's been carrying in his pocket, and he slams it on the table, and he comes over. He doesn't just slam it over there. He walks over next to me and slams it down in front of me. And it's some guy, I'm not going to say his name, but a lot of you all know he's just some radical right-wing kind of guy who's really just blustering and bellowing all of these things. I can't really hear him because it's noisy in there, but he clearly wants me to hear him. And then he even looks at me and he says, that usually triggers people. <laughs> and I look at him and I go, what is it? And then he says the name. Who's that? So he's looking for triggers, right? And I'm not necessarily trying to ignore his triggers. My first reaction is, I need to get out of here. Seriously, that'd be your reaction. You know, you, these, some of these people are really intent. I don't care if it's on the right or the left. Some people are really intense. And, and, and it's, it's anxious because, you know, you don't know how to respond and you don't want to get into an argument or a fight about something. And, and in this culture where we live in, you're just afraid of where that might go. And so I'm just looking at him and I'm thinking, I just need to get my taco and leave. And then I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. Notice something. So I stop for a second and I notice what he's trying to do and I think about what it is that he wants to do and I think about what it is that I'm afraid of that maybe I don't need to be so afraid of. Then I remember this idea that I've been thinking all week is that how do you change attention when everything is all wrong? You introduce something that doesn't fit. You introduce something else and it changes the dynamic. And so I asked him which was his favorite taco. And he started talking about his taco. And every time he'd want to come back to the speaker and talk about how that guy has been ousted by all sorts of liberal, liberal left-wingers and all this kind of stuff, I would start to ask him about what was his favorite, how long had he been in Fort Worth? And then what was his favorite thing about Fort Worth? And before we were done, he actually turned off the speaker so we could talk to each other. But we never brought up the targets or the, or the labels or, the, or those things. We brought up something we could find in common to try to redeem the moment. And honestly, I don't think it changed him. I'm sure he turned it back on when he got in his car. But for that moment, it changed and redeemed the dynamic. Sometimes we make mistakes. We step back. Sometimes we find ourselves stepping back and we're just going to keep on going. But we can take two steps forward. We can take a notice of what's going on and we can think about ways to sort of recreate what's going in there. So let's look at number two real quick. So number two is to be amazed. And this idea, I've already alluded to it, this idea of being amazed is introducing something different. Can you go to the last picture? Actually go to number three. Well, we can go to number three. So one other way that we can do that is by making changes. You can make small changes in your habits just any kind of small change, do the thing you never do, do half of it, do a fourth of it, do the smallest thing, getting up's hard, wake up and make your bed, those kinds of things. Talking to somebody who's on the other side of the spectrum's hard, so try just having a conversation about something totally unrelated, just small steps. Change the dynamic, introduce something that, that changes everything because that's the place where redemptive moments are possible, is where there's tension, that's where it's possible to be amazed. You see what I'm saying? So the last thing to show you is this interesting picture I saw about a coffee shop. I'm going to do this. I hope some of you all think about doing this too. This is a coffee shop up north, I think up in Vermont or somewhere. But um, what they started doing was one person got an idea and said, I just want to pay for somebody to have coffee. So they bought a coffee and then they put it on a sticky note and stuck it on there. If you want this latte, just show this up at the counter. Next thing you know, there's dozens of people that are buying coffee for other people. Any kind of coffee. Maybe it's a pastry, something else. You just kind of go up there. And the guy said for a while there, there were one or two people that were actually coming in and just taking advantage of it, you know, just grabbing something each day. But after a while, they started giving, right? Because you change when the dynamic changes. How many different ways can we move into a place 
and begin to physically change it. That's where the possibility of being amazed lies. Amen.